Hi, I'm Dr. Corinne Wickens, and this conceptually vocabulary instruction model um, video is going to model and discuss vocabulary squares. So the characteristics of a vocabulary square, which is often referred to as a Frere model with, you know, essentially we have multiple quadrants, usually there are four, and either the word itself is in a quadrant or is in the middle of the quadrant. And it's really super powerful for its variability and adaptability, as I'm gonna highlight in just a minute, is that there are so many different ways that we can adapt a Frere model vocabulary square for different disciplines to help support students. One of the key elements that I, is really important about this tool when it's used well is its incorporation of both verbal and visual pictures and images to create associations that will increase its efficacy and students' comprehension. So when they see an image, especially if they're able to create it on their own or use technology to input a picture, is then it cements that idea much more firmly into their working memory and then long-term memory. And what is powerful is again, the different, the adaptability elements because it includes, and variations can include some of these different attributes. It might have a definition, a personal paraphrase, examples and non-examples, because again, oftentimes what, it's, what it is not, often helps us remember what things are. It might include original sentence where we found the, the term. It sometimes includes a student-generated sentence, but as I've mentioned before, I don't recommend a student-generated sentences because those sentences often don't have a lot of meaning. They are usually done to complete an activity and an assignment to complete the task. And so many students will try to ga will game the system that there's much more other effective ways. You know, it, the idea is then if students generate a sentence that's their own, then it becomes again, much increased student ownership. But oftentimes the students that they create uh, doesn't help them understand the term any much better. Another um, attribute may be um, characteristics of the term, at, you know, functions, it might be word families. So sometimes you might want to have prefixes and suffixes um, that are important or root words. So related words and word families become important and especially in English language arts and uh, dealing with etymology or in science that has lots of Latin, helping students understand those Latin based roots to make connections when they see other new terms. And for me, the illustration, the image is one of the most important elements of this tool because again, it incorporates thus the tool, the theory of decoding where we were able to incorporate both language and non-language and we encode um, those ideas and information much more powerfully. So this is a uh, fair model ex example that's in language arts and um, by some McLaughlin's class. But one of the things, the word is on sonnet, so that's an important term in language arts. But one of the things that I want, and so we have definition characters, examples and non-examples. But visually, I want you to note what strikes you. You know, we got some use of color, but notice how many, how much words, it's very wordy, very text heavy. And so then I have to pay more attention because then I have to read more. And reading is not itself bad, but in this case, we are wanting students to help support and visual you know, use their visual processing to help encode the information much more quickly. And if I can if I have to again I'll reread it, then I'm just going to it's going to be more difficult. So this is not actually an example um, that while the care the different elements are really important, um, I would find a different way to help demonstrate that. So I'll give you a couple other examples. This one is from physical education. And so cardiovascular endurance is a um, really central topic and idea in physical education. So in this case, we have a definition. We have examples of exercises and activities that uh, promote cardiovascular endurance. We have a personal paraphrase and an illustration. So key ideas that would help students really understand that idea. 
And a lot of times, because in, in physical education, this is about movement. And so the exercises and physical activity that promotes this concept really helps tie the, the conceptual, the cognitive domain of physical education with the psycho -local, uh, psychomotor components. And so then a personal paraphrase helps because I put it, it's, a personal paraphrase is different than a student generated sentence because I have to use the words, but it doesn't actually have to be a complete sentence. But I, so in order to put a paraphrase, I have to really show and demonstrate that I understand the term. So the ability of the heart to pump blood and oxygen more easily to the muscles for sustained effort. So there aren't a lot of words in there that are confusing to me. So, you know, for, you know, ability of the heart to provide oxygen to muscles during physical activity for a prolonged, prolonged period of time. That definition itself is not terribly difficult, but in the, this, you know, my personal paraphrase, I demonstrate that I really do understand the term. And my illustration deals with, you know, the lungs and the heart, you know, and vessels, arteries, then moving that would then spread out through, throughout the body. And math often gets um, forgotten. So it's important that we include math. So this is from a um, ge uh, ge geometry unit um, or co course. And so, and part of our elements are taken out. So we have the definition of area. We have examples of area down here and how it gets determined. We have non-examples and we have related concepts of determination of area. L area equals um, length times width, how to determine area of a circle, how do we turn area of a triangle. So all of these different concepts help us to understand this big idea of area. So to reiterate is that you see that we can use it in multiple ways, but that how those visuals really start cementing the idea cannot be understated. So you can see the difference between the language arts, the physical education and the mathematics examples where we have the increased use of visuals to really help support and scaffold students vocabulary understanding. Hi, I'm Dr. Corinne Wickens, and the next vocabulary strategy I'm going to uh, model is the Frere model, otherwise known as vocabulary. It's a vocabulary square. But most of the time you'll hear in K-12 schools, you might hear it as a Frere model because that was the individual that made it popular. Now, Frere model or vocabulary square has essentially four main quadrants. And usually then the uh, main concept is in the middle. The, but Frere models or vocabulary squares can have lots of different categories and they are highly adaptable, which is one of the reasons I love them. But it is also because of the image that is most effective that helps the Frere model become really a powerful tool. Now, this discussion of vocabulary comes from high school modern chemistry text um, on chapter four dealing with orbitals. Now, when looking at, and I so decided on this one because when I was looking at a later chapter, they talked about different kinds of orbitals. And so I was already lost. So I needed to go back to the original discussion of orbitals. So that's part of your thinking as teachers is what kind of vocabulary, because you can't teach it all. So what terms are really most important that otherwise students are gonna be really lost? And orbitals seems to be one of those words. So in this case, it's because of the precision of language related to both mathematics and science that I wanted to make sure I had a definition. Sometimes a personal paraphrase might be really useful as well. But in this case, I wanted the definition, characteristics of the, of the concept and related words or ideas. So that was kind of my, you know, my frame of personal, um, personal paraphrase, but words that I could connect it to. And then an image. So I am not an artist. Uh, duly noted. So that the textbook definition refers to a orbital as a three-dimensional region around the nucleus that indicates the probable location of electron. 
No, I don't have a necessarily. I thought about trying to find a way to because it made me think about, oh, we're trying to play hide and seek. Where's, you know, a cold and hot? Where is the electron? <laughs> um, <laughs> characteristics, you, know, you have to play. Characteristics of orbitals includes the energy level. And uh, it was noted that the higher the energy level of the, of the electrons, the farther away they would be from the nucleus because more energy, and just higher dispersion. Shape, shape's important. What kind of shape it is the orbital? Orientation, and then spin. <laughs> so, you know, is it, uh -oh. <laughs> in what way is it degreed? And then how is it spinning? And most significantly, orbitals made me think of again orbit because I understand of you know Earth's orbit around the sun, the Moon's orbit around um, the Earth. So it's going something that's going around and spinning. That's one of its characteristics, spin. And so then I tried to you know, mimic and copy one of the images from the text of that is was described. And so this talks about the space and how much um, density, and then the spin and the key quantum numbers that are involved. This next example comes from English and dealing with different kinds of figurative language, which is normal in English language arts. So the word is onomatopoeia, one of my favorite words. And so then in this case, I have the definition and I wanted the, you know, because it's really unusual word, I wanted its etymology and word parts. And in English language arts, that might be use of suffixes, prefixes, roots, words, both Latin and Greek, would be really important to help reinforce the students' vocabulary acquisition and SAT, ACT preparation, those kind of things. So, and so as you think about this, not only when you think about discipline and words, thinking about age group and differentiation, you may want to differentiate and have your upper level students um, work then either in a grade level or upper level grade level, you know, have etymology as an element of a vocabulary word. But I'm not gonna necessarily, you know, well, I may or may not do that, but if, even if I was dealing with fifth graders, prefixes and suffixes are really important to try to understand how words work. And in this particular case, I actually didn't remember or recall, there are actually several different types of onomatopoeia, water, vocal, collision, air, and animal. But I most particularly think about the ones dealing with um, Collision and uh, going Batman and comics. So this is my BAM sound and the frequent um, graphic that would be in a comic book or, you know, in my 1970s, uh, eight, 19, uh, 1970s visions of uh, yeah. Batman, there we go. <laughs> and so then all of a sudden, even though it was, it was live action, Sort of, you would have, you know, interspersed with these great uh, onomatopoeias. In this mathematics example, coming from Algebra 1, is looking at issue, you know, graphing and solving with inequalities. And because they use that word a lot, and it was really confusing. It's a strange word, because I'm, I'm more thinking of social justice and um, systems of oppression. But mathematically, the term refers to the relation between two expressions in which the expression is not really to be equal to. Oh, is that what they mean? Why did they just say so? You have to you feel that way oftentimes. So then we have the symbol of not equal to or you know, greater and less than. And so, but particularly is I wanted, you know, part of the text highlighted solving and graphing. So then I wanted a couple of different examples that dealt with the numeracy and with visual images that helped reiterate that. So we dealing with x plus three is less than two. And then we're gonna solve for x or seven x is less than 28. And again, solving for x or five is greater than or equal to x minus one. So we're trying to solve these equations involving inequalities. And then dealing with graphing, we have a solid line when we're dealing with greater 
or equal to or lesser than and equal to. And if it's there's no partial equal to, it's just either greater or less than, then we have a dotted line. So in this way, again, those that visual element really helps to reinforce. It's like something that seems really confusing, and then to break it down and make it, oh, is that what they're talking about? But some of these words that are reiterated and then combined, then so if we can break it down, then we understand what they're talking about so much more easily. This next example comes from physical education. And so our key term that we're looking at is isometric. And instead of just a regular definition, I wanted a personal paraphrase this time so, and so that I could understand it. So muscles contract because of equal and oppositional forces. And as a result, there isn't any movement. Oh, is that what that means? And, it's, and then particularly is then isometric is contrasted with our typical movement of isotonic. I didn't realize that movement, it, muscle contractions that involve movement was called isotonic. Learn things every, thing, every day. And so some exercises that specifically relate to our isometric exercises involve palm press or wall push. I'm not, if there's a beam here to the whiteboard, but you know, if I was up against the wall and pressing against the force and trying to, and, or back flat, or where I was laying down on the back and trying to stretch and push down. And so again, I am no artist. And an image is that I try to really, that there isn't any, there's pressure from both sides. And so the muscle's working, but it is contracting, but it is not moving. And this last example comes from a social studies text. And the term is ratification. And given dealing with early constitution, this was an, this is a really important term. And so I, and I'm gonna play, again, I want to show you how versatile the vocab square and or fair model is. So I have very different, again, um, quadrants that I'm using. So simple definition to for ratify is to prove. And the cation is a process of whatever this is, that's what this, this shun is the act of ratifying or to prove. And so I put my image up here this time and I have a thumbs up. And so because the ratification was such a contested idea in a particular relationship to the constitution, I have a pro box and an against box. And so we have the Federalists were in favor of ratifying the constitution. For example, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. And they were proponents of a strong central government and then including um, being able to tax um, local areas so that we can have a national power. But those against ratifying the constitution worried about giving the government too much power. Does that sound familiar that still these ideas still keep um, rising in our local politics and discourse? And so very much um, in favor of states' rights and local authority. 